Well, welcome everybody, uh, and thank you for the invitation to present at this uh, meeting of your group. Um, I will be talking about Open Science Framework for Reproducible Research. Uh, we just call it OSF for short. Um, I work at the Center for Open Science in Virginia. I have a long, complex title you don't need to remember, uh, but my, mini my name is Ian. Uh, so if you have not run into us before, the Center for Open Science is, as I mentioned, a nonprofit. Uh, we're based out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, our entire mission as a nonprofit is to increase the openness, reproducibility, and integrity of scientific research. So all of our efforts are geared at accomplishing that goal. Uh, one of the major efforts that we uh, put forward as an organization is the creation and maintenance of OSF. Uh, OSF is a free and open source tool. Uh, it is something of a combination of research management and research publication uh, tool, uh, something between the repository where you're currently using and an active research management tool, uh, like you might use your local lab server or Google Drive or Box, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna start off with a couple reasons why OSF is a useful tool uh, so that you can evaluate where or if it fits into your particular needs. Um, I'll start with just the fact that it is built by a nonprofit uh, that is designing tools specifically to help researchers. Uh, so everything that it, it is is designed to help you. Uh, you are the target audience. So if it is not helping you as best that it could or if there are ways that it could be improved, we would love to hear from you uh, and incorporate that into our new designs and new developments. Uh, as I mentioned, it is free. The software itself is open source. Um, also, because we take the research process very seriously, we have a data preservation fund uh, so that there is segregated funding uh, in our organization so that if the rest of our funding disappears, uh, all of the data that is made publicly available through OSF uh, will be preserved for 50 years at the current rate of uh, cloud storage. I tend to assume that that cost will drop at some point over the next 50 years. So hopefully there is more runway than uh, even that 50 years, but that seems to be a good starting place. Uh, so that all of your research outputs, should you choose to uh, make them public through OSF, will have a good long life, uh, independent of the particular funding uh, agency preferences uh, and the existence of our nonprofit. So those are some very general reasons why you might want to consider this as an appropriate tool for research. I think for the kind of work that you're doing, there are two very strong uh, advantages for using OSF compared to many of the other tools that you might actively be using. Uh, the first is that OSF is designed to collaborate across tools. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We're not trying to be the one tool to rule them all. Uh, we're not trying to make everyone sign up for this tool and abandon everything else that they're using. We try as much as possible to directly integrate with all of these other tools and services that researchers are actively using, that they may be required to use or prefer to use. Uh, certainly, if you've ever had that conversation about which of our two tools we should use with a fellow uh, researcher, uh, you know that there can be a lot of opinions, <laughs> a lot of uh, factors that go into that decision. So we want to plug in directly to all of these tools that are spread throughout your research lifecycle from the literature review at the beginning all the way through to uh, exporting to a long-term data repository and with all of the active management steps in between. Uh, so if you are using any of these tools or if your collaborators are using any of these tools, OSF can be a place where you can all plug in your different tools together and get the benefits of those individual tools without needing everyone on the team to sign up for accounts on 
all of the relevant services. Um, this is one of the very powerful things that OSF does. You can plug in my Google Drive folder and your box folder, and we can access both of them through OSF without needing to also coordinate managing permissions on all of the other services with all of the other accounts. Um, I'm going to give you the very high level summary of all of these things, uh, and then I'll send out some supporting information if you want to dive into any of these features uh, more directly uh, or look through any of the documentation or other example materials we provide. Um, but I think the ability to plug together multiple tools uh, is going to be a, of particular interest uh, to many of you. The other area where I think OSF really fits well for the kind of uh, large scale distributed collaborations uh, that seem to be the norm uh, at your group is that it's designed to help ease collaboration across institutions. Uh, so here's just a chart of one of our example projects uh, that was created after working with other groups that were engaged in similar multi-institution, multi-site collaborations. Uh, this is basically just a structure of the actual research and data management needs of that project. They have lots of different types of material. They have material broken up by different sites. Each of those sites is at a different institution. They're working with human subjects and they're actually in different geographic states. Uh, so they have wide ranging uh, regulatory differences between the different sites. And they needed the ability to compartmentalize all of that different type of resource uh, research material, uh, as well as just something that made this manifestly complex task of research and data management easier to understand and easier to keep track of so that the likelihood of errors uh, goes down and just the ease of collaboration over these multi-year projects goes up. Uh, everyone would like to spend more of their time focusing on the actual research and less of the time trying to remember who stuck which files where uh, and asking them, is this the most up-to-date version? Uh, so this particular chart is actually built out as an OSF project. And I will take you over to that project to give you a little bit of a tour of what this kind of a complex structure might look like. Uh, this is also gonna be one of the supporting documents I'll send out to you later. Uh, because the project is designed to be sort of self-documenting so that it explains what the different features are that make this kind of a multi-site collaboration effective uh, and why we chose this particular layout for the different materials. Uh, but if we switch over, this is our multi-site collaboration example project. Uh, welcome to OSF. We've got some well fleshed out project here. Uh, so we've got a basic title and some information about who made this and when. There's a relatively long project description here. And then every OSF project has some basic tools that you can use to organize your material, uh, add some context to it, uh, and otherwise just make use of the different research and data management features attached to OSF. You'll notice that there's a citation widget up at the top. Uh, there are, there's a wiki over here, uh, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, you can have files uh, uploaded directly to OSF uh, or integrated through some of those other add-ons. And on the right here, we have the component section. Basically, components are the logical unit of organization inside OSF. So if I switch back to this description for a second, each of these boxes is a component. Uh, and they're all nested inside this main project uh, space. But the nice thing about OSF and why I refer to these as elements of you know, logical organization is if we click on one of these components, each of the components have all of the same tools and capabilities as the main project. Uh, so you can see inside this experiment component, we have all of the other 
individual site specific components, the protocols, the analysis scripts, etc. Uh, this level of the project can have a different description and a different wiki. Uh, each one of them generates a unique citation. So if you are sharing out uh, or want to just refer collaborators to specific parts of a project, it's very easy to do that. And it's very easy for anyone who sees that to cite the relevant material that you're sharing. Um, if we go back up to the main project name here, just as a quick reference, I'll show you that in this wiki tool, we have a lot of information baked into this example project. Uh, so we have the goals outlined for why this structure is set up, how that design is supposed to work, and then we have multiple other pages about how you can connect different research tools here uh, or what the specific OSF features and the roles assumed for the team on this project are. Uh, so I strongly recommend uh, that if this is the kind of research you're looking at, this is probably going to be the easiest way to just dive into figuring out how could this tool actually help in one of these kinds of long-term collaborative research projects that I'm on. Just to give you a basic tour of some of the core features involved, I'll switch gears for a second and just start from scratch. So we'll create a new project and I'll show you how you can build up this kind of uh, structure uh, or much simpler structures uh, that may fit your particular needs for an individual study. So when I first log into OSF, I'm dropped at this dashboard page, uh, which is just a list of all of my projects and all of the sections of my projects that have been most recently updated. I'm going to go ahead and create a new project here and just give it a descriptive name. And then hit create. And when I go to this project, you'll see that we have the same basic tools as the more complete finished project. We've got a wiki, we've got a file section, and a component section, etc. But because we are designing to be discipline agnostic and to support a full range of research workflows and structures, we don't give you a preset structure. Uh, we give you these tools to build one up to fit your needs. Uh, so if I want to add some basic components to this for a couple of standard types of research outputs, I can just go to the component section here and hit add component and I'll add a data component. Hit create. I'll keep working here and add just a couple more components. So we have a nice structured workspace, which is always a useful aid for reproducibility. So this one's going to be materials. I'll add one more component. Add component button for analysis scripts. Keep working here. Okay, so I've got a very basic project structure here. Uh, this may reflect the kind of output you would want to attach uh, at the end of a project, uh, but OSF can be equally well used at the very beginning of a project if you want to actively manage your collaboration with researchers through the OSF. Uh, OSF is a private space by default. So this new project that I've created is private. No one else currently has access to it. You're just looking at my screen right now, so you can see it along with me. It's called the Open Science Framework, but there is actually no obligation to make any of your research on this open to anyone at any time. So this can be a completely private collaboration space for you or for your research team. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of my colleagues here so that this can be a collaborative project uh, and show you what that process looks like. So if I go to the Contributors button up here in the main project toolbar, 
we can see it's just me at the moment. Uh, but if I hit the add button next to contributors, I get a search by name option. I'm going to search for a couple of my colleagues and add them all at once. So there's David. I'll hit the green button next to him. And there's Alex. Hit the green button next to him. And I have a couple op of options here. Uh, the most important one is just how many permissions I want to give to these other contributors. Uh, depending on the role in the research uh, that we're doing and their particular uh, contributions to it, I can give them just read-only access. Uh, I could give them read-write access, or I can give them administrator access. By default, read-write uh, is what you get. That allows people to do all of the things you would normally expect when collaborating on a project. They can add things or delete things or change things. They can also expand the structure of the project with new components. Um, the only things that they can't do that the administrators can do are add new people uh, and change permissions. Um, they also can't make public facing decisions for the project. So they can't by default uh, make this project public. I'm just going to add them as read write users and I will remain the only one who can make this project public. So when I hit next, you'll see that we have all of the different components on this project. That's because each component can have a different list of contributors and those contributors can have different access. So I'm just going to select all of them. And when I hit add, that means that both David and Alex are now going to be read write contributors to the main project and all three components inside of it. But I can change that at a very granular level. If I want Alex to only be able to change things inside the data component, uh, perhaps he's just entering data on this, I can change it so that he has a read write permission in data and maybe read only for materials. He's not going to be changing the protocol. He's not going to be doing uh, anything to the materials. Maybe he doesn't need that permission. Um, this is a key feature in the multi site collaboration uh, because people from the different institutions and at the different sites uh, want to have segregated permissions uh, so that everyone doesn't have permission to everything. Um, and it ties right back into integration with other tools because when you tie other tools, so if I plug Google Drive in here, um, what people can do to the contents of that Google Drive folder are going to depend on their OSF permissions. So when I mentioned earlier that OSF gives you an easy way to avoid having to manage permissions in all of those other services, that's how it actually works. You set the OSF permissions for the different parts of your project. You plug those other services into the different parts of your project. And then you can just rely on the OSF accounts and the OSF permissions. So you don't have to go and check in four different places to see if your new postdoc has access to whatever they need. Um, you can also store things directly on OSF. Uh, we have a nice little project structure here in the file section. If I click on one of these OSF storage icons, so I've got one at each section of my project, the main project level and in each of the three components. When I click on one, some buttons appear at the top of the file section. So here I've got an upload button and I can select a bunch of different files all at once and upload them all in parallel. Uh, you can upload any type of file you want to OSF. The only limitation is that each individual file needs to be five gigabytes or less. Uh, we will actually render some, I think three or 400 different types of files directly in the browser. Uh, so that you can see the contents of those files uh, without having to download everything to your local computer. Um, once files are on OSF, it's really easy to move them around on your project. So I added everything to the top level of the project. 
if I want to move things like my questionnaire into the appropriate component, I can just drag it. So I've got a couple of different data files here. I've got a couple of different analysis files. All I need to do is select them and just drag them down. And if I had set different permissions in those different components, uh, that would be good to go. Uh, my decisions would now guide what my contributors can actually do in those different sections. Um, if we take a look at one of them, so we can see our data dictionary, for instance. Uh, this is just a Word document, and so we'll render it in the uh, browser for you. You can't edit complicated documents through OSF directly, so audio files or Word documents or you know, large uh, complex data formats, uh, but we will version them for you. So you can see up here we've got version one. Uh, if I want to make a new version of this file, I need to edit it the same way I normally edit it. So I just open it up on my local computer, I'm going to make a change. And then I'm just going to save it with the exact same name. So I've now got two versions of data dictionary, the changed one on my local computer and the older version on the OSF site. Uh, to add that new version, I just need to follow the same procedure that I did to add the original one. So here I'm going to actually just drag and drop this new version to the same part of my project as the original one. And because I'm putting a new version with the same name in the same part of OSF, OSF assumes that this is a new version of the file. Uh, and if I click on it, you can see now that it's version two. And if I click on that version number, we can see the history of this file. So it's got two versions. It gives me dates for each of them, who made that version. I've got individual download links. And if I click on one of the earlier version numbers, it will take me back and render that version uh, directly in the browser. So OSF will keep track of all copies of all files that you upload to it. In terms of adding some more context to this, I'll give you the brief tour of the wiki. If I click on this wiki button here, uh, I'm taken to our little collaborative text editing environment. Um, the wiki is a plain text editing environment. So we have the edit window over here and then there's the preview in the middle. Um, if I want to add some additional formatting to that, we use a formatting language called Markdown. Uh, so I can either dive right in with Markdown and add the Markdown symbols for bold around this hypothesis, or I can just use the little formatting bar up at the top uh, to turn that on and off. I mentioned that it's Markdown just so that if you use the formatting bar, which will cover all of your basic uh, formatting needs. You aren't confused as to why these other plain text characters are suddenly appearing inside your edit window. So if I add in some details, and then scroll down to the save button at the bottom, we will see my edit window disappears. And if I click back on the main name of this project, that first part of the wiki has been directly incorporated on the project's homepage. Um, so that gives you a, a really good ability to uh, add some important context. Um, this can be a central to-do list for your project or sort of a readme directing people to the different materials in that project. 
uh, whether that's for private reference, uh, internal to your team, or should you make any of this public uh, as a way of sort of giving a guided tour. Uh, the last thing that I'll show you is the process of actually making it public. It's pretty straightforward when I click make public. It warns me that I am about to put something on the internet and I should be sure about that. And when I hit continue, it gives me the option to select any or all of the different components. Uh, I can make just this top level of the project public and keep all the components with the actual files private. Uh, I can make everything public or I can just decide at the end of this project uh, or whenever we're deciding to make things public, let's just make the analysis scripts public. Uh, let's just make the materials. Uh, maybe those are things that you don't already have uh, ready publishing tools for. I'm not sure if they fit inside uh, the repository structure you currently have. Um, or maybe some of these are just the only things that uh, members of your team are comfortable with making public. Uh, we're big believers that publishing as many of the research outputs as possible uh, is an aid to understanding and reproducing the published literature. And so we try and encourage as much as possible, but give you as much control as possible so that you can use this as a private research space uh, that allows you to more easily cherry pick things uh, for sharing with the general public down the road uh, without feeling that you need to move all of your data at the end of the process or identify new tools. Uh, this should be a straightforward operation from, exam, from within your existing research working environment. So that's the very basics. Um, as I said, I'll send out some information about other instructional and reference material that we have, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, if people want to explore some of this further. So you can put questions either into the chat window or you can maybe come in with your video and raise your hands. Um, so Ian, if you stop sharing your screen, then we probably can see everyone. Yes. Yeah, right there, stop share screen, a red button. I think, I think you're... There we go. There we go. <laughs> so if you if you turn on your video, then we can see you wave at us if you would like to ask a question. Dwayne, go ahead. Hi, Ian. I'm I'm sorry if I missed this in the presentation, but for the various uh, categories of components. They all looked pretty much the same other than their title. Do they have any custom functionality depending on which component you select? No. Uh, so at the moment, it is basically just a visual identifier. Uh, so you get a different icon uh, depending on what type of component you, says it, you say it is. Um, all of the capabilities are the same. Uh, if you're using our API, and we do have a fully featured API, um, it's a attribute that you can get back for that component. So you could incorporate that into your own uh, workflow automation uh, processes. But at the moment, we don't uh, build any additional features around that through the website. Okay, thanks. And we've got a question in the chat window that is from Mark, out of curiosity, what is the underlying code framework for OSF? Uh, so it's a free software project. Um, it is, uh, it's a modular code base made out of a number of different components, um, but we're the primary authors of it. Uh, it's available on GitHub, uh, should you be interested in examining it uh, or running a local instance. Uh, though the people we know running local instances are generally full institutions or sort of national governments. Uh, so it probably uh, is not going to be the right fit for uh, individual research project or research teams. Okay, John. I was just going to say during my my times down there, though, I was seeing a lot of people working on Python. 
code, <laughs> but uh, that seemed to be a big one. I guess the, the question that I have is, um, how much, what sort of time and expertise would you expect to have to do to sort of get a project up and going and connected of where you might have three or four different people and you'd like to hook up to GitHub and you'd like to hook up to Google Drive and you'd like to hook up to, you know, a reasonable number of sort of sort of tools there to get everybody sort of on board and up to speed. What, what sort of a, a, a cycle would you expect that to, to, to be? So, in general, I think the, the level of complexity and the number of features you would need to use for general research management and collaboration um, are on par with any of the sort of commercial file storage tools. Uh, so if you were bringing a new team into Box, uh, it would be the same general level of like, well, how do we upload things and where are the buttons? Um, that shouldn't be particularly burdensome. Uh, things can get slightly more complicated when you're including a number of different integrations uh, because each of them has slightly different features depending on what the other service will let us do. <laughs> uh, so GitHub, for instance, you can make read-write connections through it. So it's possible to have some analysis script, for instance, that's stored on GitHub. You connect that through your OSF project and one of the features I didn't showcase is that for plain text files, you can actually edit them straight through OSF. Uh, so you can, on the OSF project, make an edit through the website that gets saved to the file living in GitHub. Um, the other version control systems that we integrate with, uh, GitLab, Bitbucket, for instance, do not allow that. They're read-only connections. And so just depending on the mix of tools that you're using, uh, getting those initial assumptions together may be slightly more complicated than just if everything is on OSF and everyone is just using OSF. Um, I think that's still going to be a significant time savings from here are the four tools that we're using. Everyone create accounts on these four tools. Use how to use, learn how to use all four of the tools. And here's a guide for how we're going to stitch them all together. Uh, yeah. Hopefully you know, that's a time saver. You know, one of the things I was sort of, sort of wondering, sort of relative to that, is like, for instance, you know, I've got a, a box account, okay, and I've got a, a folder that I'm willing to sort of share with the group for use there. Can I then hook that up to OSF and then the group has access without me going through the box things to give access to each one of the people individually? And that sort of thing. Then the the then all the control moves to OSF. Is that is that that sort of the the thing? Yeah, that is exactly how it works. You would connect the individual folder to one component uh, or to the main project level in OSF, and then what people can do with the files in that folder uh, depends just on their OSF permissions to that component or to that project level. So if I don't have a box account, but I'm a read-write contributor to the data component where you've stuck this box folder, I'm able to see everything in there. I can add files to there. I can take files out of there. We can treat that as a genuine shared space. Okay, okay. And, and probably the thing, the issue that is that I'm probably going to have to go to box to get some sort of a key that I can pass on to OSF that will then give OSF the permissions to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's the, yeah. the, that's sort of the, the API key or whatever you call it is, is going to be it. So the person that's setting it up, it's probably going to take them a little bit longer than for just everybody that's going to use it. But a couple extra clicks uh, when you go to the add-on screen and you connect a new account. And presumably there's instructions. Uh, it's even more straightforward than that. Just the first time you do it, we directly redirect you to the other service. So we drop you right into the box website that says, do you want OSF to be able to connect to okay. your files? And you say yes, and it takes you back to OSF. And then each other time that you connect, you're just presented with a, the list of your box folders and you select the one that you want to connect to that part of your project. And then it just appears as a 
instead of the OSF storage icon, there's another icon in that same component that says box. Uh, and it you, displays all the files in the same way. And we'll still render them directly in the browser through OSF. Uh, we assign them all unique persistent IDs because uh, every file on OSF and every component on OSF and the project on OSF all get unique persistent IDs, which is just the URL. So you can then connect that box folder get a short OSF URL and just give that to someone on your project team and say, this is the file I need. <laughs> okay. You know, that, uh, that, 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 that sounds helpful. Yes. If you can, if you can figure out where on the box site to go, you're a better man than I <laughs> That's anyway, I don't want a bad mouth box website, but I will. Uh, I see there's somebody else in the, uh, in the chat window there. So I'll let them get their questions. Yeah, so this is from Christy, and she says, I noticed that there was a revision tab. How does that work in terms of sharing revisions? Is it just a different file or different dates with different dates or some other method? Uh, so I can actually just show you that uh, if I switch back over. Uh, so we've got two different versions of the data dictionary file, wait, group chat. Uh, the most recent version is always going to be addressable at just the main address for that file. Uh, but if I want to click on one of these earlier versions, we'll see that it's just appending a little question mark version equals one. Uh, to that file name. Uh, and I can actually just do that for any version of the file, including the current one. Um, and that will direct people to the specific version of that specific file on your project. Does that? But, but they are different files. Yes, we keep each version of each file on OSF so that they can be independently referenced and downloaded. Mm. Okay. So I had a question, and I apologize if I didn't catch it in the beginning, but you said you can publish your, your data through the OSF. Where does that go, and how do people find those data? So you can publish really any sort of uh, file or research output through OSF just by making that project or that component in the project public. Um, it becomes uh, available directly through our internal search. Uh, we also index things with Google. Uh, so uh, if people search for your name or the project title, uh, you can add tags and so forth to the different components to help guide search that way. Um, but we're also really big fans of using those short URLs as reference uh, inside your publication. Uh, so I've seen people point from their figure caption for here's this large complex figure that deals with lots of data. <laughs> here's the exact data file that it comes from and here's the exact analysis script that generated it. And if you're curious, you can just dig right in there. Hmm. Uh, and the URLs are so short that it doesn't even break the flow of text inside the figure caption. Okay. Uh, so you can directly refer people or they can Google it. Okay, but the data are not becoming like independent objects that somebody can find through other means and they don't get a DOI or they're not being citable or anything. So you can actually get DOIs. Um, we do it at the project or the component level. Uh, those are freely available once the project or the component is made public. Um, you can absolutely use those uh, instead. Um, if you are interested in getting some additional discoverability uh, or you know, just moving the location of those files, um, we do directly integrate with Dataverse and Figshare uh, so that just like with the other add-ons, you can drag your data files into that Dataverse data set, for instance, um, and the actual files will then live on that particular Dataverse instance, uh, whichever institutions you've connected to, uh, but you'll still be able to refer to them through that 
OSF link. Uh, and if people go to the OSF project where you may have other materials or context uh, around that, uh, they'll still be able to see all of that as a unified project. Mm. Uh, so. Okay. Are there any other questions for Ian? <laughs> Dwayne, go ahead. Okay, well, this is a little bit of an off the wall question, but it, the system looks so general purpose that I'm just wondering, has anybody used it for something completely or tried to use it or abuse it for something non-science related? And do you have to police the site? Like I'm thinking um, somebody wants to set up a fantasy baseball league or, or a homeowners association wants to share data with their homeowners and that kind of thing. Has anything like that ever happened? Not in any sort of large scale. Um, I think the the number of free cloud storage tools out there, uh, unless you're dealing with massive large data, um, is high already. <laughs> um, we have seen a couple uh, sort of not research specific, but just you know general public good kind of activities, uh, some small nonprofits using it to distribute educational resources or things of that nature. Um, and that all seems to be par for the course and we're, we're perfectly happy with that kind of use as well. All right, any other question? I'll throw, I'll throw one, Ian. Uh, what, what do you think are the new uh, are the new frontiers for the open science framework? What are the what's the stuff that you you are working on that you sort of see happening in the future? I'm always always eager to hear. Uh, so we actually just updated our um, product roadmap uh, to expand on some of that. That's just up on the uh, cos.io website. Um, the general areas of current growth. Uh, are around making things easier and prettier to use uh, so we can sort of get past the early adoption crowd into the general research ranks uh, where all of the open science uh, and reproducible research stuff is trying to move. Um, we've got a couple features in particular, uh, groups and collections uh, that are made uh, or will be released uh, to try and make large scale collaboration uh, and the sort of aggregation of lots of different projects easier so that as people continue to use this and the number of resources uh, out there continues to grow, um, people can still navigate and collect things uh, in useful fashions. Uh, but I think in general, it's a, it's a challenge because the, the sort of bleeding edge has gotten so far ahead of a lot of the bulk of researcher uh, practice and even new researcher education. Uh, and so you get to the like fully computational reproducible binder notebooks and everything looks on GitHub and you know they spin up a virtual cloud for every activity. Uh, and then everyone's still just using SPSS GUIs for their intro to statistics methods classes and pre-registration is a scary new concept. Like, okay, there's there's a spectrum here. <laughs> and you, you want to be able to tr give options for everyone to move incremental steps ahead, regardless of where they are in the process. We, uh, we can often slide the spectrum down a little bit from SPSS GUIs all the way down into Excel spreadsheets, which oh, yeah. help us all. <laughs> yeah, the universal calculator. <laughs> Equal sum. Yes. Please encourage bad practice. <laughs> All right. It looks like that was everything that people were wanted to ask. Um.